officially, good evening. We are here in our uh, third town hall, virtual, virtual town, town hall for the, the University of California, California Berkeley, Berkeley Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Department. And, and I have the pleasure, pleasure to be sitting with the faculty, members, and the students, and uh, we, we want, want to give you an opportunity to ask questions regarding the program and perhaps address some of those uh, um, questions ourselves and talk about some of the issues that I think you're thinking about when deciding uh, what university to attend. So to start, I am Juan Pestana. I'm a professor in the geotechnical um, uh, group and I'm also a participant in the um, energy uh, infrastructure and climate uh, program. And I'm going to start with um, my faculty colleague, my right side, Philip Filippo. Uh, hi, everybody. I am uh, Philip Filippo. I am a professor of uh, structures uh, in the structures program. I, I also teach courses that uh, relate to architecture, and we have a degree program that we coordinate with them. Uh, and I also happen to be the faculty advisor for the seismic uh, team, which we are going to talk about later. Hi, my name is Sophia Hamilton, and I'm a senior here. Uh, my emphasis is in environmental engineering within civil, so I'm really interested in air quality and climate change and energy, and I also have a minor in energy engineering. And I'm the president of our honor society, Chi Epsilon, um, so that's my main involvement with the civil engineering clubs. Again, I'm Juan Pestana. I'm a professor in the civil engineering. If focusing on geotechnical issues, uh, I have been a faculty advisor for both ASE and Chi Epsilon, and I'm now the chair of the outreach committee for the department. Hi, my name is Chris Blaylock. I'm a fourth year civil engineering student. Um, I actually don't have an explicit emphasis as an undergrad, but I have focused a lot on structural classes along with some construction and project management related courses. Um, I'm involved with Chi Epsilon, like Sophia, as well as being the project manager of the concrete canoe team. Hi, my name is Mitzi Stevens, and I'm the undergraduate advisor for civil and environmental engineering. Um, I've been with campus for about 30 years, and I've been advising undergrads for about the same amount of time, because I really love uh, working with all the students. Um, I would be the first person uh, you would come to to get some help. If you're interested in research, I can point you in the right direction. If you're having um, questions about what courses to take, when to take them, what types of courses, I would be the, also the person to come and see. If I can't find the answer, um, if I don't know the answer, I can find it for you. So drop by my office. I'm Joan Walker. I'm a professor here in civil engineering. I have a lot of affiliations, so I'm in the transportation engineering group. I'm in the systems group. I'm in the ECIC, which is Energy, Civil Infrastructure, and Climate. I'm also in an interdisciplinary uh, center across campus called Global Metro Studies. And my specialty is human behavior, so I deal with the humans and, and how they interact with civil infrastructure systems. I was an undergrad here 100 years ago, and I did concrete canoe, so it's a real great experience. Excellent. So the, the format of the, uh, the town hall, uh, we are going to address some general topics of interest to many students. And then after we address those topics, we are going to start answering questions that you will send to us. And um, it, so that the next 20, 25 minutes, we're going to be addressing general topics. And then we're going to be addressing your questions. So please be prepared and send your questions uh, through um, YouTube. So one of the first things that we wanted to address is how the faculty work with the students. And uh, let's just start with Joan. And okay, so um, you know, being a faculty member here, the greatest thing is the student body, but the undergraduates all the way through to the PhDs. And we have a lot of interaction with undergrads. So how do we interact? First, in our courses, that's what a lot of people think about. You know, we do teach our classes. and. Uh, and try to impart our wisdom that way. But I think the really, um, the engaging part is when we interact with students outside of classes. So certainly in our office hours, we all have office hours. And if you come here, wherever you go, I really encourage you to go. We're often sitting there a little bit bored and lonely. And uh, 
So definitely come and talk to the faculty. We are busy, but we really care about the students and we want to talk to the students. So, um, and then also we work with students on uh, sometimes through the project team. So I remember when I was on the Concrete Canoe team, you know, there were faculty that we were quite close to who really, you know, there's kind of a social aspect to those things. And then uh, this is a research institution. So a lot of what drives what we do is we're really interested in research and coming up with new ideas and to make civil infrastructure better, the world a better place. And so undergrads work with us on our research projects. and. Um, and, uh, and so that's, uh, you know, often we have a team where we're working on research. I'm doing different research on the new Uber and Lyft and car sharing and autonomous vehicles and students are helping me collect data and process that data to understand how these new transportation modes are really influencing uh, urban systems. Philip? Um, so as Joan was saying, we have a, a significant involvement in the teaching of both undergraduate and graduate students. This is one of the hallmarks of this place, even though the university is one of the top-ranked universities in the country. We take pride in our regular faculty teaching both undergraduate courses from uh, all the way from the sophomore to the senior level, and so we interact extensively with students in the classroom and then outside the classroom. This is something that you will find in very few places around the world. Um, in addition to that, we advise uh, students. We each of, each of us have about 10 undergraduate students for advising every year, and we follow their progress. We discuss with them their career prospects and the selection of courses they may take. Uh, moreover, as you also heard already, we advise the different teams that we are very keen on uh, participating. We have a seismic uh, competition team. We have the concrete canoe team, steel bridge team, environmental team, construction team, and these teams are not simply participating, but typically they end up in the top uh, uh, positions uh, nationally, and so we are very proud of their work, and I think it's a great extension of the classwork, what actually goes on in the, in the teamwork for those participations. Phenomenal. So one of the things uh, that uh, I want to emphasize now is student collaboration and how students work at Berkeley and for that I'm going to ask Chris to go first. Sure, uh, so I guess coming to Cal, um, one of the scariest things for me was just coming into a big school, you know, thousands of students, I was trying to figure out, you know, how do I make this a smaller school and particularly um, when I started taking more civil engineering classes, I uh, got to know more of the civil engineering students and got more involved with some of these organizations, it really helped shrink the school um, and make it a little more accessible for me. Uh, for example, Chi Epsilon will hold um, tutoring hours. So I participated first, you know, just going to tutoring hours, having, having older students help me out. I also have had the chance to um, be a, a tutor in those um, sessions, so that's been a really good experience for me. And then more recently, in the last two years, Concrete Canoe has been a really good experience for me getting involved. And some of my best friends now at the school are actually through the Concrete Canoe competition. And now we end up, we'll do homework together, we'll hang out on the weekends. So that's a really important aspect of the student experience. Yeah, um, as Chris was saying, I think the students in civil engineering are really friendly, so it's really easy to work together with the people in your classes, and the different clubs we have definitely help you a lot in meeting people, so you can have friends to work with. Um, some of the other resources that I've been involved with are Chi Epsilon helps put on an advising night every semester, along with some help from the department. So we have faculty and students from Chi Epsilon and some graduate students there to advise the undergraduates about everything from which classes they should take to studying abroad or how to get research. So there's a lot of resources that you can get help from. And I think Berkeley has a reputation for being really competitive, but I think in civil engineering it's more collaborative, which I've really enjoyed. Very good. That I will um, leave us, uh, lead us into some of the, the aspects of the student life, and that's the participation on the student activities, the, the, the clubs. Can you mention a little bit more about uh, particular activities? Yeah, um, so activities that I've been involved in, as I mentioned, Chi Epsilon, um, it's a fun organization. First you join and you have to be a pledge and go through a pledging process where we teach you how to do some professional development and tutoring and also just have a lot of social events so you can meet people. 
Um, I've also been involved outside of civil engineering as well. Um, we have these things at Cal called decals, which is student taught courses. And I ran a course for freshmen called the Insider's Guide to Berkeley Engineering, where you have three students teaching every section and just helping introduce the freshmen to Berkeley and give them advice because it can be kind of a big, scary place. Um, I've also been involved in the solar car team, which was fun. Um, it's a lot of mechanical and electrical engineers, but I worked with the chassis team, um, which is like the frame of the car. Um, and I've also been involved in the Greek system, which was another fun way to meet people outside of engineering. And Berkeley just has so many clubs, both inside and outside engineering, and it's really fun to get to try both of them and meet all the people Berkeley has to offer. Great. So, Mitzi, would you be so kind as to give us an idea of uh, what kind of activities do we have as a department for the students? So a lot of the activities center around our student groups. So you've heard a little bit about the, the competition teams, Concrete Canoe, the Steel Bridge, uh, Chi Epsilon. We also have the American Society of Civil Engineers, which is a larger group that encompasses all of the teams and helps support the teams. Um, the ASCE, as we call them, um, they hold a lot of workshops that are also professional workshops to help um, help guide students, should give them an idea of how the inter inter um, interviews go. Um, they also have info sessions where they invite companies to come and talk about their companies and sometimes they will have interviews at that time. They hold job fairs which all the student groups also kind of collaborate in. So it's kind of um, a huge group effort, a community effort as you, you know, as you will. Um, you know, that's one of the things that I really loved about the department where the students, faculty, and the staff all kind of get together and all work for a common cause and have that really close community. Um, I think that's... Sure, and I could actually uh, jump in on that myself. Sure. Um, in terms of like career prep and networking, such, uh, stuff like that, um, Berkeley has a really great alumni network. Um, you see when we have these career fairs or these info sessions, most of the time you're getting Berkeley grads coming back. So they understand what the student experience means. Um, you know, they're able to hook you up with good internships, um, good jobs after graduation. I am actually, um, I got an internship for this past summer uh, through an info session we had, and I've actually continued working with them throughout this school year and will be continuing on full time. So I think um, that's a really great example of how the department kind of goes out of its way to um, connect you with um, opportunities after graduation. Um, Mitzi, one of the things I wanted to, you to uh, focus on is the professional development program. I mean, okay. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Sure, so the professional development program started about six years ago. Um, basically, it came across as a program to help students from the freshman level up. So students in the freshman level would be exposed to some decal classes, um, some seminars, uh, teaching them how to write resumes, how to do interviews. Um, we also have other classes like uh, CE 93, or excuse me, 90, 92, and um, it gives them a little idea of the different emphasis of uh, civil, um, civil emphasis, excuse me. Um, to choose from and to kind of understand different areas that they can go in. Um, one of the other things that they can do with the professional development program is um, one of the requirements is to go out to a company to visit, um, kind of critique it and see how it works, talk to people, do a few of the jobs and then write a paper on it. At the end basically you can write the paper and then present it to the professional um, community. That's right, and in fact, um, I, I happened to serve as the chair for the outreach committee when that program was developed, and I had the pleasure to essentially direct the freshman seminar. The CE92, which is the freshman seminar, is a seminar where we expose the students to different disciplines within civil engineering. So it's, uh, we bring people from the industry, uh, many of them are CEOs or managers that are well-versed with the 
range of opportunities in, in their particular discipline. And what we do is we go over uh, more of a, a, a sh to showcase what kind of projects a person that is working in civil engineering will participate in. And the, so that's the, the, the objective of the freshman seminar is to provide a framework to um, essentially spark the interest in the different, dis in the different disciplines. And of course at that stage you're, uh, you're going to be taking some of the uh, freshman classes which are tool classes, uh, your, your, your basic um, classes that you're then going to build upon to go to the discipline uh, that you choose. So uh, the next two years, uh, year number two and year number three, we focus on essentially decal courses, which are essentially student-run uh, courses when we bring uh, faculty and we bring um, participants from the industries to essentially give you a glimpse of how to act in a professional environment. So we essentially talk about how to write a resume, how to prepare for an interview, what kind of activities do we do, what, what is the kind of professional behavior that is expected in, um, in the real world. And then finally we go C192, which is sort of the final uh, seminar, in which we bring again some of the people from industry, but now we go into projects in a lot more detail. So it's not a showcase anymore. You now have all the tools. You may have taken all the courses in your particular discipline. And now the particular talk becomes alive uh, with the details um, that, um, that essentially brings civil engineering alive. So the professional development program also has a leadership components. So you are actually required to participate and to be in a leadership position. You are required to uh, uh, give presentations. And at the end, you, give, uh, you get a certificate of uh, participating in that program. So many main students have actually chosen that. Uh, it's an additional work, but it's doable. And most students say that it's uh, very, uh, very rewarding for the time invested. So I, as far as the careers and the career preparation, the, one of the comments and the questions that students have is the, uh, what kind of opportunities do they have once they get to Berkeley? What kind of trainingships do they have? What kind of research um, they, that they can participate? And um, I want to address a little bit of that and then I'll pass to some of my colleagues. But one of the things that we do here is that we encourage the students to actually do uh, research um, and so they are on the graduate opportunities for research. Most of those opportunities appear in the third and the fourth year. Uh, typically the first and the second year, most students are uh, focusing on the basics. Uh, many students actually have uh, summer jobs, they have summer uh, internships, and we encourage that. And um, so most likely you're going to be able to do a summer internship the first year, the second year, and even the third year. But you can also exchange that for a summer job working in a research program. And uh, I happen to be the program direct, the, um, the director for the Pavement Research Center. And we have, um, after teaching my class, which Chris survived <laughs> uh, last semester, I was able to um, essentially hire seven students to work with me uh, at the Pavement Research Center. So they are currently uh, working there. Some of them are continuing for the summer, and some of them are only doing it this uh, during the semester. But it's, a, it's an opportunity to um, ex be exposed a little bit to research and to do some work in, a, in an area that you may not be familiar with. Um, anybody wants to talk about uh, internships or particular opportunities for internship in, in the different disciplines? I can talk about my experience with that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've had experiences with both internships and research. Um, for internships, the summer after my freshman year, I worked at an energy engineering consulting company in San Francisco, which was really interesting. And then I also spent the other half of the summer doing a study abroad, a, well, sorry, study abroad language program in Sweden. 
and the next summer I did um, a summer research program. I haven't done research here at Berkeley, but there's a really cool program through Berkeley called the Cal Energy Corps, which has research, research internships over the summer all around the world that are paid for, and they're all related to sustainable energy. So I got to go to Hong Kong and study the urban heat island effect, which is how cities will get a lot hotter than the areas around them, and we were studying how if your city is more dense, does that like make it hotter because your radiation will be reflected back and forth more, or does the shading help make it cooler? And uh, we concluded that the denser your city is, the shading will actually make it cooler. But that was a really fun experience, getting to travel and do research. Um, and the other summers I've done more internships. Sure. Uh, I kind of mentioned it before, but I had the opportunity um, through one of the info sessions here with a construction company that does a lot of large construction projects throughout the Bay Area. So I got to spend my last um, summer working on a construction project in downtown San Francisco, which was a lot of fun because I'd get to go in there every day, um, work there, and then uh, luckily they had an opportunity at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs um, right by campus. So now I'm working on a project up there that I've been doing for the last six or seven months now. So I'm able to just hop on a bus, go and continue my relationship with that company, which has been a really good experience. And you know what they say is they really love hiring Berkeley grads because uh, the foundation we have, you know, they'll be hiring from a lot of different schools, but they kind of see that the, the general uh, diversity in what we learn here is really important for basically any sort of um, employment opportunity. Any comments on opportunities in, in, in terms of doing new research on campus? You know, it's really easy for undergrads to get involved in research here. It's um, you know, it does take initiative on your part for the most part. Sometimes we will pluck students out of our classes, but the key is to look around and figure out what areas excite you and go and talk to those faculty. You know, we're always willing to take students on our projects. Um, and you know, it's this is a research institution, so we're really trying to come up with new ideas and new solutions and we're trying to train students who will also you know go out there and come up with the new ideas and new solutions so getting involved in that research side I think is a is a great experience Philip I was briefly going to mention the opportunities that exist within our world famous earthquake engineering research center which is one of the many research centers we have on campus uh, you realize, of course, that uh, earthquakes do take place from time to time. We have been fortunate in California lately not to have too many strong ones. And in the process of identifying the damage in, during earthquakes, we send out teams of students uh, that get organized by the center. We have also opportunities to process the records from those earthquakes for which undergraduates are well suited. And so there is quite a number of uh, internships available through the earthquake center that students can take advantage of. I was going to mention a couple of things regarding uh, internships. Um, most of our faculty are practitioners as well, so not only we do teach, but we do provide service to companies, to advisory boards, uh, to the government, and of course through our contacts with industry, we provide a lot of um, networking for our students. So. When the students are looking for jobs and for summer internships, it's not uncommon that the students that are taking classes with you will come to office hours and they ask you to explore a little bit more about the particular subject that you're teaching and say, well, if I wanted to explore this a little bit more, would there be any opportunity for, for an internship? And, um, and of course, we, we try to place them and, uh, according to their, their needs and according to their interests. And one of the things that we do notice is that this actually is, is phenomenal because it gives you the opportunity to actually, the, the student, to actually try something that they haven't tried before, to explore in a little bit more detail, to have a real life exposure to the practice in that particular discipline. And then uh, if they do well, one of the things that happens is that the companies, uh, they do like to hire the undergraduate students that they have had for the summer interns. So many of the summer interns actually find full employment even before they graduate. They already line up with a particular industry. Um, since uh, several people here have mentioned the topic of study abroad, I was one of the faculty mentors for study abroad, and I have been doing that on and off for, for the last few years. 
And one of the things that we have for our students is the opportunity for students to go abroad and either take classes to enrich their, their program um, or to essentially do something different. And um, again, we, we tend to work with the students very closely uh, when they're doing study abroad. We want the, the study abroad to be efficient and uh, there are, you know, initiatives on campus right now to sort of pre-approve certain courses and, at given universities, so to make it easier for the student when he goes uh, abroad to a particular university to know exactly what courses are they going to be, get credit for, and and that provides uh, a significant help in planning your uh, your degree, and uh, so that's um, an important issue, and I, I know that uh, Sophia mentioned that uh, this is an opportunity. Most students uh, typically go to uh, English-speaking countries. Uh, he, most of my students, the, the students that I was uh, supervising, uh, went to Australia, to New Zealand, and many others went to Europe and uh, or South Africa. And uh, so again, there is a there is a vast network of opportunities to go abroad and and enrich your academic experience. So with that, um, any, any final comments uh, that we want to mention about? Now, I, wa I want to ask you something. Uh, yes. Joan, of course, is not only a professor here, but she was also a student. She yes. actually went through Last through century. Our no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Last millennium. Last millennium, <laughs> Last millennium. Yeah, that, that is true. But, um, you know, you perhaps have a, a big perspective of um, how is the, you have seen it for both sides. What, what do you see, what makes Berkeley unique? What makes Berkeley tick for you? Yeah, it's a good question. So the, I mean, I think there are two things in this level. One is that, you know, Berkeley's just so strong. Berkeley's big. We do everything. We do everything well. The only thing we don't do is we don't have a medical campus, but, you know, our last Nobel Prize was in medicine, and so, you know, we actually do that pretty well, too. And so the, the caliber of everyone on this campus, from the staff to the students, the faculty, is so high and so diverse. And then combined with that, it's a really warm and friendly place. I think that everyone here wants everyone to succeed, and there's a lot of collaboration, and that leads to a really interesting interdisciplinary environment that, um, and it's kind of a relax, like I was out in Boston actually for 15 years between my undergrad and coming back, and you know, I was teased about being a laid back Californian. You know, it is kind of, it's this intense environment, but it has a warmth and a relax uh, environment to it that I just, it just makes it such a great place. You know, people are happy to be here, and yeah, we're intense and we work hard, and, uh, but there's nothing like it. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so, well, so what are we going to do now is I have, um, we are receiving some questions uh, live and we are receiving some questions offline. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, post the question and I'm going to ask the panel here to address those questions, okay? So the first question that I have here offline is, uh, can I graduate in four years? Anybody wants to take that? Oh, I'll, I'll take that. Um, <laughs> definitely. You would have trouble not graduating in four years. Uh, you'll find that, I know for a lot of other schools, particularly in California, um, it's tough to get through in four years. However, uh, the curriculum here is really well set up um, that you, know, you can definitely get through in four years. And in fact, if you're not, if it's looking like you're not going to, um, you'll be pulled into Mitzi's office. <laughs> and very quickly, you will have a plan uh, to be done in four years. I know that said, you can petition to have an extra semester if you have a minor or if you do a special study abroad program or something like that. But in general, um, I would say it's definitely not a fear that you don't get done in four years. And I'll just add that um, I had a minor on top of my major and I'm still finishing in four years, so it's not too difficult. And you went abroad? No. Oh, well, in I the didn't, summer. I didn't go abroad during yes. school year, just during summers. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> So, would be more impressive. Yeah, the way most students do it is you come in with a lot of AP exams, and so a lot of those AP exams do count for some of the lower division courses. So that kind of helps you, you know, stay on track and be able to uh, graduate in four years. Yeah. I also want to mention that more recently the department has um, ha opened some of the courses that um, that perhaps may be impacting your progress towards your. 
your completion. Uh, they have opened those courses uh, in the summer. So it is possible to actually even accelerate your graduation. I've seen a few cases in which students have graduated in three and a half years. It's not common, but it's possible. And again, uh, I think the issue with the study abroad, especially if you go study abroad during the fall semester or the spring semester, I do think you, you can graduate in four years. In fact, we're encouraging you to graduate in four, in four years, but you do have to plan it carefully. So you do have to meet with your advisor. And, and one of the things that I cannot say enough is that you will have opportunities uh, regarding guidance uh, for your career that you have to take advantage of. I mean, your advisor here is looking after you, but, um, but it requires you. So it's very difficult to, to guide you and, and to provide feedback uh, if you don't go and talk to your advisor. So again, it is possible. It is possible to even graduate uh, in less than four years. I've seen people that graduate with a more time because they're doing other things. They're doing minors in other disciplines or they're doing combined programs. Uh, but in general, uh, four years is, is pretty much the norm. Um, excellent. <laughs> Can you go abroad while pursuing an engineering degree? Uh, I think we answered that already. Uh, you can go abroad. It's normally done during the, uh, the school year, either the fall semester or spring semester. I have not seen it done during the entire year, but it's possible. Um, could you talk about your interaction with faculty? Sure. Um, so I think the one thing I've really been struck by, particularly with the civil engineering department, is how friendly the faculty are. Um, and I'll have to be completely honest, some departments outside of civil engineering, I haven't seen that. You know, I went to an, a one or two of my un, uh, lower division classes um, where there was maybe 500 people in the class. You'd go and it'd be a bit more geared towards, you know, talking to your GSI, which is a graduate student instructor. And the pref professors would be friendly, but um, not quite as engaged. However, particularly in this department, um, anytime you're in a class, you're having trouble, you know, professors are really open with office hours. You can send them an email, set up extra times. Um, I know also uh, we each have a faculty advisor, um, so at least once a semester we have to check in with them, go over our class schedule for the next semester, and just kind of discuss how everything's going. Um, however, I've personally found like I can go meet with my uh, faculty advisor even more than that and just you know chat about things, how's, how are things going, talk about careers, grad school, anything like that. And I've, I've never really come across a professor who hasn't been incredibly helpful and friendly with that. Even me? Even you. <laughs> yeah, no would, pressure, no pressure. <laughs> I would agree that our faculty are super approachable. Um, just one anecdote about that was in the introductory concrete class that everyone has to take. When I took that class, um, our professor, Professor Montero, had us do a contest with all our lab groups of who could design the strongest concrete. And supposedly the winning team from every lab section would get to go have pizza with our professor. But then he said that anyone could just come. So I didn't win the contest, but I got to go and have I pizza did. with him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, no pressure. <laughs> they're really nice. <laughs> All right, um, here we have a question. What makes Berkeley unique? Anyone? Philip. Uh, first of all, you got to realize that uh, there are very few places in the world that are so blessed in their natural setting, which means that uh, people are naturally happy living in such a great place. Secondly, a, na a natural setting of this magnitude has generated also a significant interest internationally. So we have a number of great international visitors which bring life to the department, exchange students, uh, faculty from other universities all around the world. So the climate in the department is so um, multinational, multifaceted that you will enrich your life in more ways than just engineering. So. I know very few places in the world that can measure up to this. I think um, what's special about Berkeley is it's really cool being at a big school where you have everything. And I think that makes the people here very interesting because everyone has a lot of diverse interests that you can pursue. 
Um, for example, I've taken a lot of classes in the Scandinavian department just for fun um, outside of civil engineering and it's cool that you can just be exposed to everything. Like we have an amazing engineering program but there's so much school spirit and everyone gets really excited about the football games so I think you get a really amazing experience having everything here. Yeah, I definitely agree with what Sophia just said. Um, you know, obviously we all love and probably all of my favorite classes have been civil engineering classes. Um, but also I've had an interest in like architecture and city planning and things like that. So I've had the opportunity to take a couple classes in the School of Environmental Design and City Planning. So right now I'm actually in an urban transportation planning class. So just the opportunity to kind of branch out, um, see things that are related but not necessarily within the department. Um, however, the department does a really good job working with us to make sure that fits in our schedule, and I think that's unique among you know, big schools like this. So Berkeley is the first university of California built, and so there's a lot of historical value in, in Berkeley itself. So you can take a look at the Phoebe Hackerson Hearst, uh, the Julia Morgan buildings, uh, the people are just wonderful. As Professor Philippou says, there's a lot of diversity, and so did Sophia and Chris. Um, so many people come here and so many different cultures and things that it kind of blends, and Berkeley is very open and uh, welcoming in letting all these things happen and accepting. So um, I love being in Berkeley because I can meet a lot of different people. I can sample a lot of different foods and talk to all the various different people who come to visit us. So I already described what I think makes it special, but one of the things I think that's really telling about Berkeley is that everyone who's here wants to be here. We're not like, sometimes on, especially faculty, it will be people will look at places like as a stepping stone. They're trying to get to that next place or they're, you know, there's a place they didn't quite get into. And, and I just feel like here, everyone's here. We don't look elsewhere and think, oh my gosh, I wish we were there. It's like, we're where we want to be. And it's, uh, you know, because it's just such a great place. Yeah, so I, I would have to second that as well. One of the things that um, what makes uh, Berkeley unique, um, and, and again, most people here have talked about Berkeley itself, the university, but it's the, the amount of activities uh, in which you are able to participate. If you were to go outside of the department, there are so many activities of other student groups on campus. I've seen people participate in um, you know, the intramural sports, there, are art, there is arts, uh, events, there are, there are a multitude of things that you can participate on campus that are not related to your own uh, discipline. But in, that, in, in addition to that, you're in close proximity to San Francisco, Oakland, and of course the activities multiply. And you, you, are, you are exposed to a, a very rich uh, artistic uh, uh, environment is a very stimulating environment. Uh, you can feel the energy in the Bay Area. A lot of entrepreneurs, new companies, um, new ideas, new designs. So I, I do think that Berkeley is is in an area where it's, it's particularly well located um, as far as possibilities. And, um, and again, being so close to campus, you can actually work in companies that are at the cutting edge. So I, I think that makes Berkeley a particularly unique. For those of us who enjoy food, and um, I'm not pointing fingers, but um, you know, food here is phenomenal. And um, the, uh, we, we have uh, some of the gastronomical, you know, uh, highest points uh, near the Berkeley area. So I, I do think that there are other things besides uh, the man doesn't live on bread alone, but he needs bread. So I, I do enjoy that component. So I, I have another question here that was related to something that we talked before. And it was, how much space do you have in my career to take courses outside civil engineering or non-technical courses? Um, well, the way that it works for our major is you can, you're supposed to take at least six humanities classes outside of engineering, and if the rules are still the same, um, you can get out of two of those with AP classes, and two of them have to be about reading and writing, and then the other ones you can choose basically whatever you want. So a lot of times some people will take all their humanities in one area and get a minor in 
for example, public policy, a lot of people do that one. Um, it's not too demanding, but it's fun because you get to explore some things outside of engineering and there's usually room to take more if you're interested in taking more than those six required courses because they're not quite as demanding as our engineering classes, so it's easy to add on some more of those. Okay, I have a, a, a question from Stephen Shelnut who is saying, how, how strict is the class schedule? Will I, will I be able to take many classes outside civil engineering? Um, yes. <laughs> I didn't think about that for a minute. But yes, it, it, Sophia says you have um, six humanities courses that you are required to take, but that doesn't limit you from taking other things. Because you come in with so many AP courses, that opens up, you know, time frames from, uh, to take a little bit more, such as if you've AP'd out of math, uh, with a score of a, a, a five in the BC, you've cleared two of your math courses already, and that opens up a couple of spaces. So you kind of bump up your next level of math, and then you open two more spaces to take other outside courses. Um, there's a lot of PE courses that you can take if you like sports um, or just physical fitness. Um, we always encourage you to take more humanities courses because engineers can always grow a little bit more and have a chance to take those classes that they may never ever get another uh, chance to take that may be interesting to them. Um, when I talk to seniors, they get down to the, the end and they find that some of them will have at least two classes or at least three classes of technical courses. That opens up some space for them to take, you know, maybe three other classes that they're really interested in and you can take those pass no pass and just really have fun for your last semester. So it is very possible to take more than um, more courses that are non-technical. And to speak to that, I mean, I'm in my eighth semester, and I think I've only had one where I was in all technical classes. Every other semester, I've been able to mix in at least um, you know, one non-technical. Right now, I'm actually in two. So I'm in two civil engineering classes. I'm in the, the transportation class, which is more the, the planning side of things, and I'm also in a UGBA, which is Undergraduate Business and Association, so that kind of focuses on um, some finance stuff. So you definitely are able to fit other classes in, um, but at the same time, I think most people who are graduating will have taken more civil engineering classes than are required, just because we like it. Like, we find stuff that we're interested in, and we like, you know, taking more of that. So. You know, there's definitely flexibility, but you'll find yourself, you know, finding things that you really enjoy. I suppose also the question may refer to taking courses that are out, uh, other technical courses that are outside civil engineering. So there is also opportunity within the College of Engineering to take courses outside civil engineering that are in mechanical, IOR, operations research, electrical engineering, computer science. So I suppose if the question was addressed for that, I think there's plenty right. of opportunity. So so for the civil engineer, you've got 15 units of technical electives that you can choose from, and you can take them from any of the engineering um, emphases, you know, the mechanical or nuclear. So there is some freedom to do that and kind of broaden um, your overall experience here in the civil. For those of you who are listening to us, 15 units, uh, typically our, our classes are three engineering units, so it's three units, so that would be five technical electives that you can choose and you can actually take some, some of those uh, courses outside of the department. I have a question here regarding um, advising. See, who can advise me about classes and who can advise me to take the right classes at the right time? Okay. Who wants to take that? So. I can take that one. Okay. So. Basically, you would start with me. <laughs> I'm the undergrad advisor. Um, so I, I bring you into my office and we talk a little bit about what you wanted to do. Um, if it's more of a, if you're an upper division student and you needed a little more guidance in the area of emphasis that you're interested in, I would then refer you to your faculty advisor who has all the expertise depending on what you're interested in. Or if you don't know, I talk to you a little bit more and find out what you would like and then I kind of refer you to the appropriate faculty like Professor Philippou or Professor Prestana. Um, the other thing that you can also do is you will also have a 
third advisor. So basically you'd have three advisors. You'd have me as your departmental advisor, you'd have your faculty advisor, and then you would have a college advisor who would walk you kind of through all the bureau bureaucracy of um, the, the college. And all three of us put together, you can come to at pretty much any time with any issue that you have, um, and we can assist you with these things. Faculty and staff are, they work hand in hand. I've had some faculty who would contact me if um, they noticed that there was a student, wasn't a student in class, and they would kind of ask me if there are things wrong or, you know, if I kn knew what was going on. And um, the faculty do care. Um, and they will always come and engage with you and try to find, you know, how they can help you. All right, all mm -hmm. right. And I would, let me follow that. I mean, that's sure. kind of the formal system, but there's a big informal system also. Like, you can talk to any faculty at any time about mm -hmm. your courses. I think the students do a great sure. job of advising each other, and, and Chi Epsilon has all sorts of infrastructure to try to help students yeah. figure out uh, how to figure out their classes. So. Yeah. You want to mention more or what? Oh, well, I was just going to say the faculty who aren't your advisors are really helpful too. I've had professors where I really like their class, so then I asked them which other classes I should take that were similar, and that's really helpful. And actually, to add one more thing, um, to get even more informal, uh, one piece of advice, regardless of where you end up going to school, is befriend an upperclassman, uh, because having someone who's kind of gone through it before mm -hmm. is incredibly helpful. And I think. Um, some of these organizations like the competition teams or Chi Epsilon or ASC are really good opportunities to kind of meet these people and get to know them. Um, you know, I had some upperclassmen that I knew when I was younger and they were able to say, oh, you want to take this class before this class because, oh, I, I heard this rumor that they're not, you know, offering it this semester or, you know, oh, if you take it now, then, you know, by this semester you'll be able to take this grad level class and that'll be, you know, even cooler. So just those sort of conversations you can have are really helpful. Okay, I have a question here regarding class size. And it says, I have heard that Berkeley classes are really big. Will I get lost in a big class? Um, well, so there's a lot of different class sizes here at Berkeley. In the beginning, they'll be bigger and scarier, but I don't think you really get lost. You have discussion sections with your GSI, and those big classes are the, are the ones like math and physics where it's not as specific to your major. Um, but I think as long as you make friends in those classes, like Chris and I, I think, had like all the same classes our first semester, so we were in a giant math lecture together. But you just make friends and work together. Um, but then once you get into the upper division civil engineering classes, they're a lot smaller, like, I don't know, somewhere between like 20 to 60 students. It kind of varies. And then it's more specific to what you're interested in, and the professor is more invested in like you as a student. So you won't get lost. And, you can even take like really small classes in other departments. Like I took a Finnish language class that had like eight people in it, so that was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree. Um, some of the, the earlier classes for your lower division credits can be a little, um, a little scary because you go in and there might be a couple hundred people in there. However, all of these large classes, they have smaller sections, so you'll work with another 10 or 15 students and a graduate student instructor. Um, so that kind of shrinks the size of these classes. Um, and then for the, you know, the upper division civil engineering classes, uh, those never really get much bigger than 40 or 50 people, and a lot of them are actually closer to maybe 20 or 30. Um, so there, you know, you can get to know the professors, um, get to know the graduate student instructors, and also by then you know a lot of the people in the classes, so that also helps. So the other thing you can to do is, um, you know, join into some of the social events that the American Society of Civil Engineers group puts on that encompasses a lot of the teams and a lot of the students that you might be in class with. Um, there's many different things that they offer throughout the year and that's another great way to start meeting people within the civil community. Very good. I have uh, Jaffe72. <laughs> do most students pursue a career in industry or do they go on to get their masters for more experience in a particular discipline? Can I have uh, so I would say I would say that the way the world is today and the uh, technical expectations, most students should eventually get a graduate degree, and that is re regardless of whether one st stays in Berkeley or goes to another university or whether one studies at another place and comes to Berkeley for graduate school. 
However, a number of people choose to, a number of students choose first to practice for a few years just to see how the world looks outside and then return back for graduate studies. And very few of them eventually also end up pursuing some higher degrees like a PhD. Do you agree with that, Joan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. To what, okay, Stephen, um, what advice could you give to a student deciding whether or not to move on to grad school? So now I, I choose you. Oh, now I have to speak up. Okay. Um, you know, the thing about the, being an undergrad here is that we do have all these different uh, disciplines, structures, geotech, environmental, transportation, and so forth. And as an undergrad, I don't think it's that important to specialize. I actually think it's good to get the breadth and kind of explore and figure out what you're interested in. In graduate school, you do have to specialize. So you pick one of these areas and you really get, you know, in-depth knowledge in that area. And so in order to go, the one thing when I talk to students and they're not quite sure where they want to specialize, then I think that's a good idea to go out and work a little bit and sometimes even just take a little break from school. I know I took some breaks between my degrees and when you come back, you appreciate school a lot more and how special the academic environment is. And so, um, but for those people who know exactly what they want to do and what their discipline is, I would say go right ahead and get that graduate degree and move on into industry afterwards. Philip, can you describe a little bit more on the, what is the Master of Science uh, at Berkeley and, and how long it is? I mean, is, a, is it possible for a person to go from the undergraduate and continue on and, uh, for the Master of Science in structures, for example? So a, a, number, of, a number of students, uh, after their four years of undergraduate study, uh, go straight through to the graduate degree. Uh, the graduate degree is another two semesters, so essentially a year, but uh, more cl closer to eight months. And during that time, uh, the students typically take uh, five or six courses in an area of specialization with the other two or three courses coming from a group of subjects related to the field, but not necessarily in that narrow field. So there is also a possibility of uh, some breadth during the graduate degree. That's called a Master of Science degree. Very good. I have a question here. It says, can I take some of my requirements over the summer? Let's see. Um, yes. So as a freshman, there are a lot of summer or lower division courses that you could take. Um, probably not recommend you doing it as uh, the first year freshman, but um, the summer right after you start, there we offer uh, CE 30 um, and CE 85. Um, we've got E7, you can take your math courses, your general physics courses. So if you wanted to kind of get a leg up or just advance a little bit, you could take some of the general lower division courses um, to get you off the, 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 the stepping stone there. All right. So I think this question is actually for you guys. It says, for the undergraduate students, was it difficult to balance your coursework with your involvement in extracurricular activities? Honestly, I think it like it works in the opposite way of what you might expect. Um, some people you might say, oh, like you're spending all this time doing this extracurricular activity. Um, does that take away from the amount of time you're studying? And I think in some weird way, um, for example, in Concrete Canoe, you know, I spend the more time I spend in Concrete Canoe, um, the more comfortable I actually feel in classes. And you know, you develop friendships and relationships with people in these organizations to help you out, and you have a support network for these classes. So in the end, um, it can be challenging, but uh, I think it actually helps getting involved with a lot of these extracurriculars uh, when it comes to schoolwork. Yeah, I didn't do any extracurriculars that were as time consuming as some of the construction teams. Um, I typically had like several smaller extracurricular involvements, but it wasn't too difficult to add those onto school. And I kind of like doing that because you could always kind of just regulate like how many of the smaller involvements you trying to get overwhelmed. Okay, I have another question that is also for you. How did you decide to come to Berkeley and how do you know it was right for you? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think just when, when I was kind of evaluating colleges, um, 
you know, looking, first of all, you know, the ranking looks great. And I was like, oh, like, it has to be in the conversation. And then when I was actually able to visit campus, um, talk with students, talk with professors, I got the sense of a community. Um, you know, you go to some schools that are excellent schools, um, but they don't feel quite as friendly. And when I came to Berkeley, I definitely felt that you know, everyone was there, you know, even though it might have a reputation of being competitive, I think everyone was there to help. Um, and that was kind of a, you know, the, the mood that I really liked. Yeah, I don't know. For me, it's funny looking back on how I ended up here because I think it was all kind of like a whim. And like my mom had to force me to apply here, which is really <laughs> weird. But I'm from Marin and I feel like every single person in Marin went to Cal. So I didn't really understand like the magnitude of how good of a school this is. And I also think I kind of picked this major on a whim because I just was like, oh, yeah, I'm good at math and like I like the environment. So that sounds good. <laughs> um, and then I did an overnight stay program when I was a senior in high school. And the people I met were just so amazing. And they were so passionate about everything they were studying and involved in so many things. So that was why I ended up choosing here. And it was a really good school, as I later realized. Um, but being here, it's like been the best experience ever. Like the people are amazing. The school is so great, like all the classes and everything. And so I've loved it so much. Okay, I have one, uh, one last question, or maybe two uh, last questions. <laughs> um, the, the first question is, how good is teaching at Berkeley? Let's start with the professor. With the, oh, it's fabulous. Couldn't okay. be better. <laughs> couldn't, be, couldn't be better. I think particularly, this department is one of the best of the campus. So, so that's not our weakness. That's our so, 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 so now let's hear from the students about teaching. How good is teaching in, uh, in this department? I've, I've been really, really impressed with the teaching, um, particularly just uh, you know, all these professors, they're leading researchers in the field. Um, so they could basically ignore, just, you know, do the bare minimum for their teaching requirements and get by and they'd still be leaders in the industry. But the fact that they take the time and really put their hearts into these courses that they teach, you can tell in every single class you go into um, that they want to be here and they want to be teaching you. And I think that's one of the huge things that makes the civil engineering department here really successful and a great student experience for undergrads. Yeah, I've had such great experiences with all my professors too, and I think it's really cool that your professors might be like the leading expert in their field, and you're getting to learn from them, and that's really amazing. Okay, the last question um, we're going to address, uh, is the engineering curriculum flexible enough to switch between fields without taking an extra year? That's a tough one. Yeah, it is. Um, it's possible to do. You do have to um, have some careful planning in it. So, you know, one of the things that you can do is you've got several different resources. You can talk to advisors and do a four-year plan and kind of, um, kind of put it all into perspective. Um, as I said, again, you know, you've got a lot of AP work and stuff like that, so you can get out of some of the classes. You've already satisfied some of the requirements. Um, and depending on the major or the minor that you want to get into, um, you can pretty much lay it out in such a way that you can also maybe have some extracurricular in it as well. Um, some of the things that I would recommend is you can also utilize your summers. So um, at the most, the college would give you an extra semester. So you would be four years in an extra semester to accommodate maybe uh, the second major or your minor. All right. So with that, what I'm going to ask the our distinguished panel to, in 30 seconds or less, each one of you will try, what would you say to a person that uh, Berkeley is the place for you, Berkeley, the civil engineering department at Berkeley uh, should be the one, should be your choice. So what, what would be your answer? So my answer is that if you like uh, an international environment with multicultural and multifaceted exposure, if you thrive by meeting a variety of people, and if you are comfortable dealing with some of the brightest minds around you, then I think Berkeley is your place. Yeah, I think if you're really passionate about this subject and you're excited to study hard, but also meet amazing people and have fun in beautiful Berkeley, you should definitely come here. 
I, I agree with all that that's been said. Um, I'd also add that you know if you're looking for somewhere that's really a community where you know you'll be continually challenged by the people around you, but also supported by the people around you, um, this is really the place for you. Yes, the civil department is very community minded. All the faculty and the staff and the students really like to kind of spend time together, and it's very easy to start a conversation and just kind of. Uh, be really have fun have fun together yeah I think it's the people you know the brilliant motivated collaborative uh, fun <laughs> it's just a great place to be I couldn't agree more I, I have to say that for me personally the students are stimulating I cannot find a, a better crowd and um, and I one of the things that I do notice is when I attend some of the classes of my, prof my colleagues, you know, I get so excited. I wanted to be in that class. Uh, sometimes <laughs> I don't have the time for that, but that's a different story. Uh, it, re it really gives me a great pressure, and I wanted to thank uh, all the members of the panel for such a fa fantastic job and uh, for uh, enjoying this, uh, this hour with me. And uh, I really... I want to thank you for, for listening to the, uh, um, for the town hall, and uh, I have to close this up. Thank you very much, and go Bears! Go Bears. <laughs>